up to the podium for the presentation of the Zenger Award for Press Freedom. Somebody should have gotten that known video. All right, good afternoon. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, I, I can't believe that we have uh, such celebrity in our presence, uh, and two celebrities. Because when I uh, spoke to Hildy and asked her what she was working on, she said, well, I don't really like to discuss what I'm working on at the time, <laughs> as a true professional journalist would say. You'll read about it soon, and then, of course, I went into recruitment mode. Well, hopefully you're going to be a student here at the University of Arizona. She said, well, I'll take that under advisement. <laughs> so, Hildy, thank you for being here for everything you've done. Um, I, I'm very glad to be here to help celebrate the incredible achievements of Christiane Amanpour. Um, and I have to say, as I was speaking with her earlier, and many of you who know me, that I... Uh, I usually get home about 11 and I stay up way too late watching every news show and hanging on every word. And um, on the weekends, of course, I, I've watched her, but I've watched her for, you know, two decades plus. And, you know, it's just an honor for me to, to meet you, but to be here to present this award. I'm the least qualified person to present this award. It should be or JP or somebody else, but I'm, I'm glad I get the uh, chance to do it. Um, you know, I got a chance to work with a guy named Bill McRaven in, in uh, Texas. Uh, Bill McRaven was the guy who ran special ops and really tracked down Osama bin Laden. And he then went on after 37 years of service to the country to uh, take on the toughest job he's ever had, which was being chancellor of the whole U University of Texas system. And after about five years, he said, yeah, I'm, I'm done with this. This is too hard. But Bill made a comment uh, about a year ago that he said uh, he was a journalism major at University of Texas. And he said the greatest threat to our democracy in his lifetime, and I would say in the history of this country, is this unrelenting attack on journalists and, uh, and free press. And so I am so happy to be at the University of Arizona where, uh, as I arrived here, uh, people talked to me about, you know, you've got the number one astronomy program in the world, the number one water program in the world, and oh, by the way, the School of Journalism and the business is known as the New York Times of the West. So I, I, I was incredibly impressed when I uh, toured the, the School of Journalism and and they said, you're the first president who's ever been over here because most of the presidents are afraid of us. Uh, <laughs> And, and when I invited Hildy to come uh, uh, to my office to visit with me, and I said, I'll, I'll go on record with you and interview you, Christiane was saying, well, is your agent, I'm, she may uncover, she may go and get some skeletons in your closet. And I said, bring it on. I'd, I'd love to have that. So uh, our, our journalism school, I can't tell you how uh, 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 proud I am to be here representing the university and every chance I get, I talk about all the great things at the University of Arizona. And uh, I'll, I'll just make a note, um, just, just like Andy Weil when I got here, uh, in my world, Andy Weil is really the godfather of integrative medicine. And I said, Andy, um, you know, where's your, where's your center? And he said, well, it's a little rundown house over on the street and all this stuff. And I said, we gotta build you a center. And I'm happy to report that uh, through uh, some generous donations, we're going to have a center uh, for the founder of the movement of integrative medicine. That's great. But I, I was also struck with, I love that you're in the Marshall Building. I may be getting in trouble here, but I think you need your own building and something big and really put the spotlight on our School of Journalism. And now, now I'm getting in trouble, but I'm just speaking the truth, because the truth is the truth. And, 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 I, and I would say, I, I have to listen through, I just came back for, I know I'm going on way too long, Nancy, I'm, I'm, I'm about to finish. Uh, I just uh, was at the Board of Regents meeting and heard about the school up north, uh, about how they've bought this old historic uh, uh, newspaper building in the middle of Los Angeles, and how they got great journalism, their 
Walter Cronkite School of Journalism is going to be now in LA and you know, all this stuff. We're better than them. And we need something here uh, that, that uh, emphasizes how great this School of Journalism is. All right, so I, I need to get back to the script here. It is, it is with great honor that I give you, Christian Amanpour, uh, the University of Arizona School of Journalism's John uh, Peter and Anna Catherine Zinger Award for Press Freedom for your extraordinary contributions to fr uh, press freedom and the people's right to know. You certainly epitomize, and I think anyone who's ever watched your work uh, know that journalism is all about courage. Probably, you know, as a, as a heart surgeon, I think I'm a tough guy, and I've been on the front lines of when people die, but your courage, truth-seeking, holding those in power accountable, and providing people with information they need to self-govern is uh, something that I hope inspired Hildy as she watched what you did and of course her father and so it is such an honor to present you this award and thank you for making the time to come to the University you. of Arizona. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Do we have an award? Yes, uh, President Robbins, I'm really sorry. I nearly, uh, you know, I nearly killed you there on those steps. <laughs> um, thank you, President Robbins. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you to all the deans, to the school, to all the faculty, all the people who I've met today who have really given me such a warm welcome. Thank you to my friend, Professor... <laughs> Professor Mort Rosenblum and Jeanette Herman, who are the reason I'm here, who asked me to come a year ago, and who I really, really wanted to do this for. Not just for them, but for this school and for this reason, actually, because press freedom today takes on extraordinary significance and extraordinary meaning. Um, nice to have met you, Mrs. Guthrie. Uh, congratulations on your daughter's success and to have met all the young people here and all the students who are so committed uh, to this great, great and noble profession. As Hildy reminded us, it is a noble profession. Can I just say, um, you know, the, the, sort of, the sort of golden rule of appearing in public is not to appear after children. Um, <laughs> I don't really know what I'm going to say to match what Hildy has said and done. Um, she is, of course, not a child. I mean, she's an incredible adolescent, an incredible adult when it comes to her, her mind and her inspiration and her guts and her dedication. And she has a great dad who has inspired her, I know, because I had the chance to talk a little bit with you, Matthew, um, and I know that you've allowed your daughter um, to take the kinds of risks that not many parents would allow their children to do um, to uncover you know, drug problems in a high school at eight years old to have witnessed and reported, or at least the aftermath reported on a murder, to have uh, confronted an official, whoever that official was, and held that official accountable and held her ground on behalf of her rights as an individual. Um, not many people do that, especially people of your age. Um, I understand, Matthew, that you've drawn the line, though, and you're not going to let her be a war correspondent for the time being. I might have a disagreement with you on that. Um, many parents, I'm sure, have, have cursed me uh, out of my ear, ear, earshot because many young people have asked me what to do. How do I get to be and do what you did? How do I go to do uh, war coverage or journalism? And I say, well, you know what? I was lucky because I went to CNN right out of college and I moved up the ladder. I've been at CNN 36 years, which I know is not frightfully fashionable these days because so many people go laterally. But I was of the era that you go vertically if you're lucky enough to do that. But I know that the business has been terribly disrupted. And so I say to young people, just go there. Just go and try to find the story that you're interested in and, and go and report on it. And many, many people have done that. 
and have come back and have joined organizations and have become attached to newspapers, radio stations, TV stations. And so I think that, you know, there is a lot of merit in going out and, and finding the story. Um, there's a lot to say, and I know I'm going to ask, uh, sit down with Mort and answer some of your questions, but I just want to perhaps frame um, the discussion with a few comments up here. First of all, again, thank you very much for this, and thank you for your incredibly warm welcome. Um, first, Arizona holds quite a special place in my heart. It was only just coming back here that I remembered that uh, one of the first road trips, if not the first road trip I ever took in the United States was obviously to Arizona, to the Grand Canyon, and, and, and then on to the west. But, you know, I walked down the Grand Canyon, I walked up it at breakneck, <laughs> breakneck speed because I knew if I took it slow I'd never make it. Uh, I, I went through Monument Valley, Canyon de Chez, or painted the Painted Desert, the Petrified Forest. All these have imprinted indelibly on my mind. And for me, they are the beautiful America. And they also uh, remind me of home because I came from Iran, I was brought up in Iran, my fa father was Iranian, my mother English, and I lived there. And the climate and the topography and the scen scenery are very, very similar. Many Iranians who come to Arizona, I think, feel that way. So it has a very, very uh, you know, warm place in my heart, and I'm glad to be back. Um, I would also say, because a lot has been made of my, my T-shirt, which is not actually a T-shirt, it's a sweater, which, no, 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 it's okay. I'm merely pointing it out because I am wearing a sweater in Arizona. Uh, but I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to power through. I had a small hot flash at the, uh, at the table, but I couldn't strip off, so, you know, it's here. So here it says, and I generally do not, particularly in the post Me Too world, say, please look at my chest, um, <laughs> but read my chest. It says, it says, be truthful, not neutral. And this is not something I commissioned. It's a friend of mine in London, really sweet, who had seen me tweet this and has heard me talk about it and was quite moved by it. And she had somebody who is a, you know, I guess a jumper, a sweater maker, make it for me. Um, and so I decided to wear it. Why not? And then I decided I wouldn't just wear it. It's not a fashion statement. It's not just a slogan. It is, it is what I am and who I am. And I learned this uh, moral in Bosnia. And you saw some of the pictures up there, and you know from more that my first big story was the first Gulf War, and that sort of really kind of, well, it set me on my way, let's say. And it set CNN on its way in a major global way, because up until then, CNN had spent 10 years working its way up to being, um, you know, indispensable in the United States. But with the first Gulf War, and with this massive crisis happening and with CNN's ability to show you everything that was going on in real time, including the military buildup, including the diplomacy that was going on, and then eventually the war, that cemented CNN on the international and the US, the whole global stage. And it, 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 I grew with CNN. That was my launch as well. But after that, I went from this big set piece war to what's become wars now, which are the horrible little vicious civil wars, which pit ethnicities against each other, nationalities against each other, religions against each other in their own, own countries, um, neighbor against neighbor, family against family. And that we witnessed in the 90s, the whole of the 90s in Bosnia. And so I had been sent there, and I wanted to go. I sort of agitated to go to Bosnia because I could see what was happening, this terrible slaughter in the heart of Europe um, uh, it, for the first time since the end of World War II. And to be honest, at the beginning, you don't quite know what you're looking at. The fact of being there day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, and that was how long it took, made you understand incrementally and then rapidly what you were witnessing. And we weren't witnessing just a little civil war. We were witnessing, first they called it ethnic cleansing, and then we know that it was genocide. And it was enshrined as that at the International Criminal Tribunal in The Hague when people were indicted for it, put on trial for it, sentenced and convicted for genocide. As I say, the first time in Europe since the Nazis. But before the indictments and before the International Criminal Tribunal, I was witnessing it along with my colleagues. And we were telling that story this very 
simple but profound story that there were a group of civilians in a town called Sarajevo, surrounded by mountains, who were being attacked by those who were in the mountains and had the high ground and had the military superiority and had the political advantage of a leader, Slobodan Milosevic, who had an agenda. And that agenda was in the carnage and the mess of the fall of the Soviet Union and the Iron Curtain, wanted to carve out a greater Serbia and decided this was his chance to pounce when there was a lot of chaos on the ground. And that involved moving civilians, killing civilians, um, and generally what we saw and what we witnessed the whole time. And I was telling that story along with my colleagues every single day, that these were the victims and these were the aggressors. But the problem is people didn't want to hear that story. The President of the United States, the Prime Minister of Great Britain, the leaders of all the European powers who could have done something about it didn't want to hear that story. So what they told the world was that all sides are equally guilty, this is just centuries of ethnic hatred, there's nothing we can do about it, and it's, you know, it's, it's hard to tell who are the good guys, who are the bad guys. Well, we on the ground knew that that wasn't true. And at one point, somebody started writing some stuff about me, and some colleague suggested that I had sort of lost the plot, that Christian was going native, that Christian was sympathizing with one side, and Christian was pro-Muslim, and Christian had, you know, forgotten what journalism is all about and wasn't being objective. So this worried me quite a lot. I was very, very upset about that because I'm a young journalist, I'm just, you know, doing my thing, thinking that I'm doing a decent job reporting the story. And now I'm being implicated as somebody who's taking sides and may have been violating the golden rule, which is objectivity. So I had to think about this very seriously and examine myself and examine what my response was going to be, both professionally um, and to myself. And I suddenly realized that objectivity, of course it's our golden rule. Of course we won't violate objectivity. But objectivity doesn't mean neutrality. Objectivity means giving all sides a hearing, covering all sides of the story, going to the Serbs, going to the Muslims, going to the whoever, whatever story it is, going to all sides and getting their story as well. But it does not mean creating a false factual equivalence or a false moral equivalence. And when you do create a false moral equivalence or factual equivalence just because it, in a mistaken notion of what objectivity is, then particularly in these circumstances, which are the gravest violations of our international humanitarian law, then you are an accomplice. You are an accomplice if you do not tell the truth and if you pretend that all sides are the same. And I knew that I wasn't going to be an accomplice, so I held my ground and I kept going. And um, then everybody did and the world community did. Finally, President Clinton, with very, very little effort, organized um, a, a bombing campaign. And within two days, the Serbs, who were just bullies really, laid down their arms. And then there was a US-led negotiation that brought us to the Dayton peace process, peace agreement, and there has been peace ever since. And that really does stick with me because everywhere we go, you hear, oh, you know, what can we do? What should we say? What should we report? Who's right? Who's wrong? Where's the truth? Fake news. You know, it's all this huge amount of noise and chatter that's coming to us. But actually, you really can know what is the truth and what is not the truth by being on the ground. And the only way you know it is by being on the ground, as Mort said. There is no um, alternative and no substitute for actual field-based reporting. Um, you can't just do it by being on Twitter or social media or, or wherever, in, on your armchair, in your pajamas at home. You can't. You have to be there to be able to tell the true stories. Um, and I say, fast forward now to 2000 and whatever we are, 19, and we've got today, on this day, the biggest global climate strikes ever. And first and foremost, Hildi's generation, Greta Thunberg's generation, Malala Yousafzai's generation, these young girls, these young people 
are leading movements because they see the truth, whether it's about climate, whether it's about the right for girls to have education, whether it's about the right to report what you see and tell the truth about drugs in your school or corruption on the street. Young people are our salvation because we're not doing it and they are. And they're not just doing it as little protests waving silly little placards in the street. They are coalescing political action movements around what they're doing. You would not have all the Democratic candidates for president running talking about the climate this year if it wasn't for the activity on the streets, if it wasn't for the fact that that activity is translating at the ballot box. If you notice in the midterm elections of 2018, climate was very, very high up the agenda. At the same time, or maybe a few months later, we had the European parliamentary elections in Europe, and climate was at the top of the agenda. It wasn't nationalism, it wasn't populism, it wasn't immigration, it wasn't anti-refugees, it was climate. And so, for me, again, this boils down, come all the way back to be truthful, not neutral, for decades, and you will know this, of course, President Robbins, science has been trashed. Facts have been trashed. Evidence has been trashed. Experts are trashed. And I personally don't stand for it. And I go to the facts, and I go to the experts, and I go to the evidence, and they're the people who come on my show, not talking heads who are going to give me one hand and on the other hand. Experts. Because no matter how much populists and the others want to tell us that, oh, they don't know, or they don't know. People do know. For decades, we've had the science about climate. And for decades, and journalists have been complicit as well, we have been uh, distracted from the path of the truth. Lobbies from the fossil fuel industry, attempts to uh, divert truthful reporting. And for decades, people have tried to be neutral on this, when everybody knows that the overwhelming amount of science is here, on climate change, and the teeny, weeny, weeny, weeny little bit of deniers is down here. And we have created this. People have insisted on being neutral. And now we are at risk. Not the planet, because the planet will survive without us. We are at risk. And that's a responsibility for those of us who believe in freedom of the press, the right to speak, the right to express not just opinions, but the right to present facts and, and evidence. So I take this job really seriously because I know what a huge responsibility is put on the shoulders of people who have a microphone that reaches all over the world or people who happen to work for massive organizations, whether they're news organizations or whatever, just important platforms. Everybody who works in an important platform has a huge responsibility. And I would say at this point that, you know, it's fantastic what the kids are doing on the streets and they will be heard and it will make a difference. But until our governments and until our corporations act as well, this thing won't change. And this is simply to say that I am so proud to have as my founding boss and my mentor and leader, really somebody who I admire beyond many, many, and that's Ted Turner, the founder of CNN, who created not just a media revolution with CNN, but was always ahead of his time on the big issues of our time, um, including climate. Ted Turner brought up, I mean, millions of tracts of land in the United States, not to build and develop and use for his own personal gain, but to save, to save for conservation and for, for posterity. Um, he, uh, I asked him in his last interview with me, um, you know, Ted, there are all these young people who would ask you if they could, you know, how do I make my first billion like you did? And he said, without a flicker, green technology. And you know, this is the greatest country in the world when it comes to innovation, technology, engineering, science, all the, and everything else. And yeah, a lot of years have been wasted. We could have had a green planet and yet, we're now struggling to meet an existential deadline that the international community, the UN, and its endless um, IPCC reports have put out. Um, I asked on my show once a really amazing woman. Her name is Dr. Catherine Hayhoe. I don't know whether the scientists here might know her, but she is one of the atmospheric scientists who has put together um, the US government regular and intermittent um, 
reports on the state of, of our world. And she's, she's a very, very deeply religious, evangelical. Her husband's a pastor. I assume they're Republicans. I don't know. I didn't ask. But she says this is not a political issue. She says this is an issue where all of us should be together. And she says, you know, we have to explain to people that it's not about throwing away their life or their habits or their, you know, their comfort zones. She said we have to start telling people that the cure is not as bad as the disease because some are telling them that the, the cure is worse than the disease. So we have to, as journalists, also, you know, be able to tell these stories and not to be afraid of telling these stories. And the reason why I say afraid is because it comes now to the idea of social media. We heard that Hildy, at the age of 12 and probably younger, apparently was getting threats, whether they're on social media or in real, I don't know. Greta Thunberg, a 16-year-old girl, is getting hated and trolled on social media. Malala Yousafzai, the same, when she was in the throes of doing her thing. What? Why? My advice to all people, especially young people, and, and, and yeah, young people, just don't look at social media. <laughs> just ban it. Just don't. There is nothing to be gained, nothing to be gained from looking at all the trolling and nothing, nothing. I don't look at anything. I operate on social media just for my work, but I have a team that helps me do it. I never, ever, ever, ever read it because it's not real. It's, it's not real. It's, um, it's uh, a bunch of anonymous bullies. So don't let them intimidate you. Don't look at it. Um, that leads me into the next big thing, and that is also associated with press freedom, but also press safety. The CPJ, the Committee to Protect Journalists, reports every single year that the leading cause of death amongst journalists is deliberate, i.e. silencing the messenger, killing. This is obviously skewed from the leading cause of death in the general population, which is not murder. It is for us. And it's not, even now, it's not so much war correspondents that are, that are finding this happening to them. Now, guess who are the biggest targets? Environmental journalists and investigative journalists. So we need to be aware of how dangerous a job this can be. And it's not, as you know, people getting caught in the crossfire. As I said, it's deliberate targeting of journalists. So this is something that's very sinister. And it's, again, something that we really have to fight against and keep the faith and keep the courage. Why do I keep doing it? I keep doing it because after 36 years, I joined CNN September 1983. I still love it. I think it's a great profession. I think it's a noble profession. But more important than that, I think it's a game-changing profession. If you go back through history and right up to today, you can see that on the cutting edge of reform, no matter what society or culture, from Tehran or Afghanistan all the way to the United States, to Africa, to South America, wherever you're looking, Journalism moves the political and the cultural ball down the road. Who was it who created or who unleashed the Me Too movement? It was journalists. I highly advise and recommend the book by um, the two reporters who broke the Harvey Weinstein story. It's called She Said. I'm sure you've heard a lot about it. Um, Jody Cantor and Megan Toohey. Because it's not just about the story and the facts. It's about how they got the story and the incredible levels of of investigation and hard work they had to go through, not just to get the comments, or rather the people on the record, but also to show everybody in this era where our credibility is being mortally wounded by presidents and prime ministers and dictators and authoritarians, how they got the facts, and the facts are real, and, that, and, that, and it was the truth. So it's a, it's, a great, it's a great book, it's a great read, and it just puts, you know, puts absolutely, crosses the T's, dotted the I's on, um, again, how journalism can really make this world a better place. And you know, I don't have to list the enormous numbers of, of, of political, cultural, you know, medical um, fields in which this has happened. Um, and, and 
I do it because there's also so much variety in the in the video you showed. You know, there's war reporting, there's interviewing, there's presenting, there's documentaries on sex and love, there's uh, all sorts of things that make my um, make my work really, really interesting and fun and um, meaningful. And Brad Pitt, I interviewed Brad Pitt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Be still my beating heart. No, I don't. <laughs> By the way, I can riff on that too, if you like. Um, his new film, Ad Astra, is actually really good. It's coming out today. And it's good because it's about, again, it's all linked. I mean, all of this has some kind of cosmic link to it. In the Me Too moment, it's about men. And it's about the antithesis of toxic masculinity that we've heard so much about. It's about men being vulnerable. It's about young boys and adolescents being vulnerable. It's about grief. It's about loneliness. It's about all those things that men and boys feel that they can't express and can't exhibit. And here's this incredible actor who's known for his sex appeal and his you know, masculinity um, doing this role. And he does it really, really beautifully. And of course, it's, it's, it's this unbelievably beautifully shot um, sci-fi space epic. I mean, it's not CG, uh, it's not green screen, it was done uh, in the old-fashioned way, and it's really, really beautiful, and it's a very meaningful film, actually. Um, so, uh, just to say that I am incredibly honored to be here, I'm thrilled to have been awarded this, um, I'm so happy to be reunited with friends and colleagues, and to have met so many of you, and I'm so impressed by how many of you who came, came up to me, you know, are so energized by what you do, whether it's in the journalism field, which most, most of you were talking about that, but in all sorts of fields. The dean of the law school, I think, um, is here. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, law is, is great, and I think, I hope many, many young people go into the field of hu human rights law, because again, that's where we are in, in, our, in, our, in our moment in history right now. It's about right, human rights, it's about justice, it's about truth, it's about, you know, survival. And we're all in it together. So thank you very much indeed. Mort, will you join us? We're not going to let you get away that easy. Yep. Uh, Mort? There we go. Uh, we're going to have a little Q&A with Christiane. And um, Mort's going to start us off. You guys have a microphone there, Mort? I think you sat on it. I do, actually. Yeah. Uh, it's very rare that my feet don't touch the ground. <laughs> <laughs> this, the, these chairs are tough to get up. They're for. nice, though. Comfy. <laughs> Uh, that was that was that was fabulous. Of course, surprise. Um, we're running a bit late, so we've got questions written down. I'm going to just start with one basic one. Um, what should a, a next generation Christian be studying at J School and school in general? Well, you know, I, I have to say I'm obsessed by the climate. I, I think everybody should be studying, you know, how, awareness, um, the, the issues, the solutions. Um, depending, it doesn't matter what discipline you're in, whether it's in engineering school, whether it's in, you know, any discipline is involved in our planet. So I'm a bit obsessed by that. And I also think that, um, that this is now something that's really taken off. I mean, it really is everywhere people are talking about this. But what should they be studying? You know, I think people should be grounded in really great reading, really great literature, history. To me, history is one of the most valuable lessons um, for being a journalist, because if you think that what you're seeing is the first time you've ever seen it, you're wrong. And it's really great to, to be able to um, uh, know you know, and, and of course, I mean, history is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, it's just the greatest storytelling ever. Um, uh, that's what I think, yeah. Great. We Thanks. have some questions over here yeah. from uh, the group, and I swear to you, I didn't write this one. Come on, Nancy. Uh, how do we recover from Trump's assault upon freedom of the press? Where do we go from here? Well, you know, I don't think this is a political question. It's just a, it's just a question. and. Let's, let's put it this way. All my career, I have been in places 
which have no respect for the freedom or the right of a free press. So I, I, I was going to end by saying this up there, but I forgot, so I can say it now. Um, the difference between truth and lies is the difference between freedom and dictatorship. Um, and so we have to really, really, really be aware of that. And we have to stand up for, 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 for all of this. You know, Trump is going to carry on saying what he says because he says it for his whatever, who knows why. You know, as Mort said, there's been fake news since um, Darius the Great, right? Um, my son is Darius, but, um, <laughs> but what does fake news mean? Fake news is a real thing. Fake news is lies. Right. Or fake news is employed by people who don't like what you're talking, what you're saying about them, so they call it fake news. Um, so we just have to know what that means. But I, it, it is a problem because it goes to the heart of the most important currency of journalism, which is credibility. Yeah. And if credibility is dented and attacked long enough, you just don't know where the line is going to be. So I, I do actually worry because you don't know how effective this co constant assault is going to be. It's a cumulative effect. And I don't know whether we can take another six years of it. I don't know. I don't know whether our institutions can take another six years of being battered and bashed around. But I think they can, because I think we're resilient, and I think um, the truth will always out. I really do actually believe that. And if you look, um, if you look in the places in the world which have never had freedom and which have never had truth that they're allowed to speak loudly, they still eventually come back to it. And it's still an underground operation. This, so, go ahead. Yeah. Well, this leads us into another question that is, has to do with that. How do we view censorship of the media in various countries around the world? Do we really hear the whole story mm. in the United States? Um, no, you don't hear the whole story. You don't. Partly because of censorship, but partly it's a problem with news organizations in the United States. They don't invest enough, in general, in foreign news coverage. And I think one of the problems with all the cutbacks in the news landscape now is that uh, the first to go are in, are in the international field, right? Um, I must say, being here reminds me that I judge a, and I have done for, I think, 20-odd years, this wonderful award for young people. In other words, journalists who are 35 years and under. It's called the Livingston Award. And a, a lot of, in fact, most of the submissions come from, you know, the local, local media. And there is so much good journalism out there. It is just unbelievable. It's really amazing. So much good journalism in this country. Um, so I think that that's, you know, that's a reason to be incredibly hopeful. Mark, you have a couple more questions? Yeah, I do. I, um, <clears throat> I've got just two. One quick one. Huh? Quick. Um, how do people who really want to know, I mean, there is so much, the, the good reporting is better than ever right now. I mean, we've never had such good reporting. But it's so hard to find under this in this tower of Babel, you know. I mean, there's just so much other stuff. So, what is a reasonable guideline for somebody to pick out what's? So you're not going to be surprised by what I say, but I say, okay, go to the go to the brands. Sorry to use that word, that you know that are exactly. credible. So go to this, go to CNN, go to the BBC, go to your local newspapers here that you have faith in, that have been part of your community for all these years, that you know are going to be telling your story, holding your you know, officials and people to account. Don't, I guess because it's become such a part of everybody's DNA to pull the phone, look at Twitter, look at Instagram, Okay, fine. I, I can't stop that. <laughs> yeah, but don't rely on that. That's not the only place your news should come from. So if you want to have a little sort of like ap appetizer, a little aperitif of your social media feeds, go right ahead. But then when you want to know what's going on, it is now, in my opinion, no longer my responsibility. It's your responsibility. This is an age where each and every one of us has to assume the responsibility of seeking you know, the right, the right stuff. So you, there are the New York Times, the Washington Post, the LA Times, BBC, you know, uh, CNN, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So go there, find out what's going on. 
because the thing that pains me the most today is when somebody comes up to me and says, I don't know where, what the truth is. I don't know where to find the truth. It's easy enough. You just look, yeah. And listen, just one more. You're too good a service to let go on this one because after um, the spirit... <laughs> <laughs> right. Yes. Yeah. We got a real show here. We're, we're not going for, to forget that line. Don't worry. After... Um, I'm hot. <laughs> we know. No, I meant hot. <laughs> You're hot. Um, after um, this administration um, dumped a fairly well negotiated plan with Iran, oh. um, and it's kind of using this as the standard foreign policy of jabbing a sharp stick into a hornet's nest. Um, what should be watching? What should be looking for now in a situation that could be like one of the most serious stories we've seen in a very long time? Yeah, I mean, look, this is a very complex and yet somewhat simple story. Um, I mean, look, I've lived with being an Iranian all my life. I've had to be an Iranian in America throughout this whole anti-Iran, you know, era. Um, I've had to be better than better to prove that I'm, you know, not a terrorist or, you know. Um, but, and, and most of the diaspora will say the same. And in fact, it probably is the same of many, many different nationalities who are, you know, demonized. But bring that back to the politics, Iran has also, you know, been demonized. There are things, very bad things it does. And the Obama administration tried to rein it in in a negotiable, verifiable way. And whether it was a perfect deal is, is not, it's just, it's just not the, um, it's immaterial. It was a good deal. And why is perfect being made the enemy of the good? So you had a good deal that constrained Iran's nuclear program that was verifiable, eyes on, international inspectors there watching, you know, and, and by all their accounts, not mine, their accounts, the UN and et cetera, um, the, the Iranians were meeting their, their part of the bargain. Now, the problem is that even under the Obama administration, because there had been so many years of sanctions on Iran, and so many countries and banks and the financial system was wary of, of reopening you know, links with Iran, even though the Iran nuclear deal said that they could, Iran never really got its financial part of the bargain. Then Trump comes in and decides that this is a terrible deal, puts more sanctions on, and gets rid of the only negotiated deal that Iran has really ever entered into in 40 years of the rev since the revolution. Um, we were told that the most terrifying thing about Iran was the possibility of getting a nuclear weapon. Well, they negotiated that possibility away, and now it's a possibility again. Wow. So. I don't think that is what's going to happen in the immediate, but I think what Iran is doing, and this is according to a lot of the people who I've been interviewing, the people who really have a deep knowledge of, of what's going on there, um, Iran is trying to get the United States to sit up and take notice of them and treat them seriously. It's trying to get sanction relief, and it's basically trying to say, you want to screw with us? We can hold the entire global economy hostage. That's what they're saying right now. So if you notice, I mean, you know, the, there, were, there were the tanker attacks in the, in the Gulf in the summer, which were relatively small, relatively. Yeah, I mean, they didn't blow up goes. tankers. They didn't take people hostage. They didn't kill people. But they said, you want to talk about the Straits of Hormoz? We control it. Yeah. And then it managed to peel the UAE away from the Saudi-US alliance. And, you know, now it has concluded, apparently, that despite all the talk of President Trump saying we want to make a good deal, we want to, I want to meet with Rouhani or whatever, they, they seem to have concluded that that wasn't necessarily going to happen and that they need to make their presence felt. Hence the Saudi thing. Now I'm saying this as if they've admitted they did it, but they haven't admitted they did it, but the Americans think that they did it and have... And have Seems pretty clear, yeah. 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 So um, what happens next? The only way out is diplomacy. The only way out. I mean, George W. Bush figured that out. You know, finally Obama figured that out. 
uh, they've all figured that out. There's, I mean, G General Mattis used to say that, Rex Tillerson used to say that, all the people in the Trump administration who um, are uh -huh. now no longer there, um, <laughs> you know, said that, you know, it, there's only one way out, and that's yeah. diplomatic. Yeah, and I mean, there's talk of, I mean, if you think about it, we couldn't even 